You guys hear me? Let me just hit the uh, got it me. Oh yeah, of course. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Grasp on Robotics seminar. Uh, my name is Mark Yim. I'm the director of the Grasp Lab, um, and I'll be the faculty host today. Uh, just a quick reminder, we do have pre, uh, previous talks that are on uh, YouTube and also on our channel on the web. Uh, today, we've got um, uh, Matt Johnson Roberson, who is the equivalent director at CMU, equivalent to me, um, which is kind of exciting. He has a, he's been there for a year so far. Previous to being at CMU, he was a professor at University of Michigan. Um, he actually did originally do his undergraduate at CMU, and so now he's back there, which is always weird, an interesting thing. Um, uh, also, we've got our two panelists today, our student panelists, uh, Fernando Cladera and Tom Zhang. Uh, Fernando is a PhD student with three advisors, Ani Vijay, Ani Shea, Vijay Kumar, and CJ Taylor, and uh, Tom is with Ani as well. So if you just want to remind you, if you're joining from Zoom, uh, if you've got questions, use the Q&A button at the bottom. We'll uh, address those at the end with the panel. Um, so thanks, Matt, please. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Uh, excited to be here. Um, I'm excited for this panel because we've gotten some real uh, interesting topics. I was going to give you a whole crypto lecture on FTX, and we're going to talk about the economics of the blockchain, but uh, I'm gonna talk about some robots today instead. Um, okay, so I think we're at this really interesting point in robotics. And so I've been thinking a lot about sort of this future that we were promised. Um, now, uh, I got into robotics through self-driving cars um, in the early 2000s on the DARPA Grand Challenges. And, you know, one of the reasons I think I got excited about that, it was a very simple concept to understand, right? So it is this uh, somewhat now antiquated uh, by today's standards um, uh, model of the future where you could hang out in your car and not have to pay attention and play, I guess, dominoes. Um, but I do think that there's something very compelling about this idea of robotics being a very intuitive thing for people to understand. And I think the reason I got into it is that I wanted something, I did computer science, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it, but I wanted something that would um, allow me to relate to other people. And the physical world seemed like a useful vector to do that. And so we were promised this feature. And I guess what I'm gonna talk about today is aside from some, you know, whatever technical research that my group goes through, um, you know, where are we on that journey? And like, you know, what does it mean for field uh, to move forward? So uh, I shifted gears after working on a self-driving car kind of thing in the early 2000s because I was pretty burnt out and it didn't seem like it was going to work. I said, said as much at the time. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out in the long term. But, um, you know, uh, I got really excited about this idea of the oceans and what we could do underwater and, and really interested in field work there. And so sort of the unifying theme between sort of all the work that my group has been able to undertake is, okay, well, how do we use um, big robots to go doing big and interesting things out there in the field? Um, and I guess I'll also raise some challenges with that now where it seems like perhaps that doesn't scale. And so now sort of at some later point in my career, I have a lot of questions about, well, what should we be working on that will allow robots to scale in a way that they can't right now? Um, because we don't have giant underwater cities and we don't have huge fleets of self-driving cars taking you everywhere yet. And so the question is like, you know, where's that gap? Um, so as a, as a framing sort of mechanism for that, if you think about computer vision and sort of where it is and sort of what it has done over this similar period of time, right? If you think about sort of the arc of data set driven computer vision results, things like ImageNet, and then obviously all the subsequent challenges and et cetera, et cetera, um, they really have seen just a, a, a flourishing of uh, both research activity funding, and I would say real world results, right? Those techniques from when I was in early grad school till now simply work where they didn't work back then, right? And we kind of all lied to ourselves and said, oh yeah, this sort of works, this sort of works 50%, you know, close enough uh, to the point now where lots of those techniques like object detection, segmentation, whatever, they actually work now. 
um, robustly across all kinds of images and lighting conditions. And but the challenge for us in robotics, right, is that there is no equivalent. Right? We build canonical data sets for some self-driving car problem or some underwater research application, but even those are specific to a set of cameras or sensors or LIDARs or in the underwater case, some environment or some platform or whatever, but they lack this other, I think, central component, right? They are closed world data sets, right? And if you think about what Vision's been able to do, they've been able to do a lot in closed world data sets because you can continue to improve the performance. But if you have to take action, as we do in robotics, to kind of move or interact with the world, um, closed world data sets are, are very limited. Right? And so uh, this is just sort of a philosophical challenge. Community, is simulation the answer? I don't know. You know, that's what's been proposed. Um, we were talking earlier, and I, th I think the challenge with simulation is that you're doomed to succeed, right? And we're really, really good at optimizing things uh, for some thing that we've built, uh, but we still have yet to build a simulator that approximates the real world needs. Um, not to make everyone depressed, but I think there's some real open challenges uh, left in robotics. Um, hopefully on a more upbeat note, well, I think you can do big and cool and interesting things with um, large-scale robots today. And so the last sort of five to seven years of my career has been focused on that. Um, so I'll give you kind of a quick highlight before we dive into sort of um, uh, where I think some of the challenges are. Um, so one of the larger projects that I was uh, part of was a mapping of a submerged city. This is in Southern Greece. And so we were really interested in trying to figure out if you could do what underwater or marine archaeologists were capable of doing, but with robots. And so what you see there in the blue is with these vehicles, those are, or similar vehicles, uh, those are the Iver 2s. Um, and then we did the rest in red with um, uh, diver push units. But the goal was to create a map, a 3D model of what you see there um, on the other side of the screen, which is an architectural plan that was done in the 1960s with hand surveying tools. So they went and they take a stick. They put that stick somewhere, and then they would take a measurement, and they do that over and over and over and over again for weeks uh, to build that detailed plan you see there of sort of every sort of line of stones in the water, which, as you can imagine, is um, somewhat inefficient. Um, so really, the goal here was to run SLAM and then do a 3D construction. And sort of the, again, the early parts of the micro were focused on, OK, can we do that over a really large scale? So this is 200,000 pairs of images, stereo images. Um, uh, that scale bar down the bottom, which is some, for some reason invisible, is 50 meters. But this is over hundreds and hundreds of meters um, with thousands and thousands of images. And that's the fine resolution that you can see. If you get up close, right, you can see individual stones and rocks um, on the bottom. Um, uh, so that site was down here in the southern bit of the Peloponnese in Greece. Um, the same kind of idea is what we've been doing on big scale ROV. So this is an ROV from uh, University of Rhode Island. Um, uh, this is a shipwreck in southern Turkey. What they were interested in looking for amphoras, which held wine or grain thousands of years ago. We did a big 3D reconstruction of that um, with cameras. And you can see, okay, we get both the 3D model and you know uh, images that show you uh, all the fine scale detail, like starfish and pots and all that kind of fun stuff. Great. Um, uh, another large vehicle we got to work on was the Sentry vehicle. Um, that is a high resolution camera system. Um, that uh, the group in Australia was able to put on there. Um, so deep water camera system, great. Uh, and then we were able to do these kind of large scale again, 3D reconstruction. So we spent lots of time focused on SLAM and 3D reconstruction from underwater environments to build these big models of, um, this is a, a bacterial mat off the Western continental shelf. The reason I show all this is one, that this is sort of what I spent all my time doing, but secondly, it's sort of a, a challenge that, you know, these were projects that required me, uh, a bunch of other grad students, uh, a ton of engineering time. Um, we got to do, you know, a handful of them in my career, right? So we're talking order five to 10, maybe 15 deployments that I've been a part of. Um, uh, in Australia, they continue to do these, but at great expense and great time, right, effort. And so one of the kind of bigger fundamental challenges when I think about field robotics is that, you know, this to me was really important when we were thinking about, okay, can we do this? We've now demonstrated that it is possible to do this, right? You can build big maps underwater and all that technology, particularly where SLAM needs to be, where 3D reconstruction needs to be, where optical imaging underwater needs to be is there. The question now becomes, to my mind, well, how do we scale that, right? How do you get to a point where it doesn't cost, you know, a couple million dollars and 10 people 
with PhD level educations to do this, because I think that that is going to be a big limiting factor for this world that we want to inherit, where there's going to be all kinds of cool underwater cities or big self-driving cars. And what I guess has become increasingly clear to me is it is not a function of, well, you just build it, show that it's possible, and then somebody else, like the industry or some business-minded people, somebody over in the B school is going to come over here and figure out how to scale this. I think that there are fundamental challenges left in the way that we think about that technology that are the challenges scaling. Not that it is possible, which I think is what we were doing in robotics for long periods of time, demonstrating that something is possible. I would like to spend the kind of second half of my career figuring out, demonstrating that things are scalable. Um, I don't want to do that necessarily by going and building a company that tries to scale this specific thing. And so the question becomes, where in the technology space at a university can we demonstrate scalability without having to spend millions of dollars of engineering effort? And I think that's an interesting and open question. Uh, here's another big model. Um, this one's cool because it has lots of these weird yellow bacterial mats. Um, and this is a project done in the context of um, NASA's ASTEP. So they wanted to use this as a proxy for space exploration. Another example of a thing that costs a lot of money and do it. Unclear how it scales. Uh, more recently, and sort of other non scalable things I've been working on, uh, we've been working on trying to do this now for grasping manipulation underwater. Um, uh, so this is an example um, from one of my uh, former graduate students, Gideon, with a Schmidt Ocean Institute um, vehicle, an ROV arm, where he's trying to do uh, real-time 3D reconstruction underwater. Um, he has a bunch of fiducials in the water to ground truth it, but the reconstruction is being done live without those fiducials, um, and then trying to figure out how to dynamically place an arm. So it's a 3D image of the arm um, that was moving, actually, um, in the real world. Uh, he wants to use this ultimately for science sampling. So this is the, uh, a planner controlled slurp sampler that's going to take up uh, sediment samples from the bottom. You can see over there uh, on the other side, there's a Ross uh, model of that, which you can then task um, to go grab a sample in some location as opposed to having to pilot the arm directly. Um, and then ultimately, we linked up with um, uh, Matt Walter, who does uh, natural language processing, so that you could say, go to sample location to the robot execute now, and then it processes that natural language into um, the end effect you're going and doing thing. And this is sort of all in the aim of trying to do this, uh, you know, more scalable version of what we do now, but there's still these really big and fundamental challenges like holding this back from being used everywhere. And so there's sort of a lot, again, a lot of open questions as to what we could do with this um, and how we need to take it to the next step. Okay, so, you know, I guess is what I've been getting at. Does this scale? And I think uh, maybe not as is. So we've, we've been trying to do a couple things now um, to kind of address that. One is that you know a lot of the work we did was with robots, um, and because uh, that's what I work on. Um, but we've been trying to think about tools for a long time to give to human beings that do this you know every day already to make them more effective, right? So this is a diver pushed rig with the same set of stereo cameras and GPS for the surface. Um, to build those 3D reconstructions. And so that's a thing, you build tools for other people. Um, and there's tons of marine archaeologists, or not tons, but there are marine archaeologists out there that do this every day. And so I don't have to go, but we can build them a tool that works. Um, but the kind of second and hopefully longer term thrust that uh, my group's been working on is trying to build very, very low cost robots that are fairly capable in a field sense, right? So there's lots of work on these sort of micro scale robots that are like sense or you know, paper robots or folding robots or origami robots. Not that, these are robots that can go and be deployed. This robot can go to uh, around 8,000 meters depth. So very, very deep. So it's, it's not designed to be cheap, but it is designed to be cheaper. So the goal here is sort of be in the $10,000, $20,000 range so that you can build you know, 10, 15, 20 of them um, on the kind of budgets that we have. Um, and the central mechanism here is it's built around a, a deep water uh, spherical housing that can go to 8,000 meters. And then we build foam around that to hold it up. Um, and then we packed in, you know, an NVIDIA Jetson and some cameras looking down um, to try to do that same kind of 3D reconstruction work I've been showing you, but to do it at much, much lower cost. Uh, that's whatever um, the drawing of it. Uh, but, you know, ultimately we built one and now we're building a second. We're going to try to build a couple um, and then really deploy them and understand what the limits of something that costs $10,000 as opposed to $500 or a million dollars, $500,000 or a million dollars. With the ultimate goal of again trying to scale up that idea. 
Now the question becomes at some point, there's a break point here, right? Like, so we're not an engineering firm. I'm not gonna be able to build these things in some way that I can build hundreds of thousands of them, right? But there are real fundamental questions left. Like, can you do all this navigation without acoustics? Can you do it just based on visual odometry? Those kind of things. And I think if we can answer those, perhaps that unlocks enough to get us to a point of scalability. Uh, this is sort of the uh, drawing we had envisioning this that kind of at 4,000 meters, you'd have a fleet of those. It was much easier uh, to get an artist to draw this than it will be to uh, actually eventuate uh, this reality. Um, and now with, you know, whatever generative models, I could have just asked Dolly 2 or whatever for one of these, which would have been even cheaper. Um, but I do think that there's something to this idea of thinking about scalability. Okay. Uh, we got a cool image of a turtle with it. Uh, so we deployed this in Hawaii um, uh, already, and it's been working sort of okay. Um, and so now one of the graduate students I had on it, um, CMU, is interested in sort of expanding this. We're going back to Hawaii in uh, the fall of the coming year with the hope of demonstrating this at a couple thousand meters to show that it really does work. At depth. Okay. So that's my pitch for underwater. No one cares about underwater. I'm the only whatever. I mean, she cares about underwater, but very few other people do. Whatever we talk. People just want to care, they care about self-driving cars. That's, that's what everybody cares about. Maybe you care about it less now, but it's another element of the future we were promised, right? So this promise, stop driving cars. And it's the same challenge, right? We have the same challenge. We have these closed world data sets. You can go get Kitty uh, with what I would say has probably been the most influential academic data set uh, in sort of data robotics here. In my time, or things from the commercial companies now, Cruise has a data set. Argo, before it went out of business, had a data set. Great. But you know, it's still the same challenges, right? Like we're dealing with closed world data sets um, and getting high performance on those data sets does not seem to have unlocked some next level of performance for field robotics. And so we're still left with a lot of questions. Um, I always like to talk about the history of self-driving before we um, talk about where we think it's going. But um, you know, this has been something that people have been researching for 50, 60 years. So this is an RCA project from uh, the 1960s, where they used metal cables in the road to figure out how to keep the car centered. Uh, and then the drivers in there applied gas and brake. But there's been a long arc of academic projects all the way from the RCA project to ALV, uh, the NAV labs that were at CMU, Argo, which is an Italian project. Um, I jump on the scene with Sandstorm at CMU in the early 2000s. Uh, Stanford had Stanley. A junior and boss, et cetera. But you see this increasing complexity in number of sensors, different modalities, all those kind of things. Um, and then, you know, you get to sort of today and you look at sort of a, a modern self driving car, and it's pretty much a car with some additional wide open roof, space, maybe some cameras floating around. That kind of thing. Okay, so uh, I always like to draw out why I think it still doesn't work. Like, it's not that we haven't spent enough money on it or that we're not uh, smart enough. Uh, I think it is just a fundamentally hard problem. So this is the number of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled in the United States, uh, going back all the way to 1920. And so if you go that far back, uh, it used to be pretty unsafe to drive, um, which is good to know since many of you were probably driving in the 1920s. Uh, but that's steadily gone down, uh, sort of uh, asymptoting close to one. So now we're about one fatality per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Uh, two things about that. Um, that is actually quite a bit of distance between fatalities. So that's probably uh, maybe roughly with this audience size, about the total number of miles that all of you collectively will drive in your lives, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. Uh, now, this is not uniformly distributed, sadly. So young drivers, yourselves, are much more prone to fatalities than more experienced drivers. Uh, older drivers, sadly, as well. Uh, so when you get to the other end of the bell curve, you will also be uh, far less safe. Um, but So it's not uniformly distributed, but it is, on average, pretty good. Right, so 100 million vehicle miles is more than we have traveled with every single autonomous vehicle company together combined in autonomous mode ever. Um, Tesla has some weird statistics you shouldn't believe, uh, but um, uh, but we're talking about you know big level four cars. Uh, it's a lot of miles, or it's not that many miles, and this is many more miles. Uh, those conveniently um, also relate to the adoption of things that make a lot of sense in retrospect. Traffic lights, which we didn't have for a long time, speed limits, seat belts, airbags, ABS, electronic stability control, et cetera. Uh, I think the next big jump we're going to see is level two, level three systems or driver assist systems 
um, that will continue to kind of add to this performance. Uh, another important thing to note is that you tend to introduce something and then fatalities go up. People get very overconfident in their systems and then decide that I have a seatbelt so I can drive a thousand miles an hour and it's fine. Uh, that's not true. Uh, if there's one thing you take away from this, seatbelts do not prevent you from dying. Uh, they only help, uh, but driver assist systems are going to be similar. And so I think we're going to see an continued decrease on this. So that's a really good thing, perhaps a good offshoot of what we've been doing in self-driving for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, but level four driving is still going to be top. Um, okay, so I, I like to show these as well, because I think one of the challenges that we face is that the coverage of this material has been very uneven. Uh, so this is, goes back all the way to 2016. Uh, so World Source self-driving taxi and getting a taxi in 2016, at least that's what the AP told us. Uh, Uber had a self-driving trial in 2016 in Pittsburgh. Uh, fully self-driving cars in Arizona in 2017, no safety drivers, uh, but then apparently uh, very shortly thereafter they returned the safety drivers. Uh, then, you know, uh, there were lots of problems in 2018 and oh, and now everyone thinks it's not gonna happen. But it really is this uh, cycle where we hear, oh, there's a car deployed without a safety driver. And we hear actually that doesn't really work or it doesn't really go that far or whatever. But it's been very, very difficult, uh, even for somebody that works in this industry, to understand exactly what is happening because it is covered in a very odd way. Um, and this is sort of a, a side, but I think tech journalism would be behooved by being closer to investigative journalism as opposed to PR journalism where you get a press release from a company and then you write it up as opposed to getting concrete, uh, independently verifiable proof that the things they are saying are true. Um, but anyway, so, you know, uh, that's, this is four years ago, we were seeing all these problems and bumps and et cetera. Uh, and that cycle has continued in fits and starts for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. Uh, most recently, uh, Argo AI shut down, Nero's laying off lots of people. Um, uh, Hyundai is laying off lots of people. Um, but then if you read another article in that same week, it says Cruise is all driverless and they're everywhere. And it's going to be great. Um, and that's uh, yesterday, I guess. Uh, and they're going to enter a large number of markets. That's like, again, two days ago. Um, and then if you go on the internet, um, this is four or five cruise cars, all stops simultaneously, uh, blocking traffic in San Francisco. Um, which apparently happens very regularly now. Uh, so I don't know is the answer. I don't know what's going on. I'm hoping we get into this on the panel, but it's very, very difficult because it's very hard to parse out what is happening. Because I work in this area, we work with a lot of self-driving car companies and we're doing cool and interesting stuff. But that's not what people care about. People care about, can I go get in a car, go from point A to point B and have it be cheaper and safer than what I do right now. And it's very unclear, uh, I would say, uh, at today, almost certainly not. The question is, how far away are we? And that um, sort of goalpost keeps getting moved. So um, I think there's a lot of challenges that we're sort of left with here. Uh, to kind of underscore that, here's the Gardner hype cycle. Uh, so that's where autonomous vehicles were uh, in whatever, 2015. Pretty far out there, slope of enlightenment, looking good. Uh, Okay, then what happened 2017, moving a little bit forward, uh, moving even more forward in 2018, even though it moved backwards in 2015, but ignore that. Uh, great, now in 2019, down there. Uh, okay, I guess that's bad, I don't know. Uh, and then in 2021, they just took it off the thing. So I guess they don't know what level of hype it is at. I don't know what that really means, but um, it seems bad. Um, okay, so... I think that draws out the question, and I promise I'm going to hit you with some actual research in a second here. But the question is like, well, what should we be working on, right? What should we be working on? Uh, uh, clearly, we do not have the money to compete with the cruises of the world. But the question becomes, have they settled in on the right solution? Because it seems at this point that there's a very strong competitive race toward converging on the same sort of approach. And I'm not convinced that that approach gets us out of whatever local minimum we're in right now where things kind of work, but not well enough to scale, right? Okay, so what has my group been working on? What do I think are the interesting things that we could possibly be doing uh, that maybe will allow us to get out of this, right? Sure, doing it on time. Great, uh, so I think weird sensors, yeah. Uh, less brute force approaches. I remember talking to, this is years ago now, but I was talking to some people at Uber APG 
and asking them, what are the size of the curated data sets you use to train, let's say, your object detector? And he gave me a really interesting answer. He said, look, it's actually really variable. Sometimes it's really, really big. Sometimes it's smaller. And I said, well, what's really big? He said, ah, we'll have 200 million labeled images of cars to do a car detector. And I thought, wow, I don't think we have the budget for that. Uh, so that's a tough one, right? Uh, so I don't think we should be trying to approach certainly um, any of those challenges that require 200 million labeled images. That is uh, probably the research, that is a labeling budget that is larger than the research budget of if you were to take five uh, large universities doing robotics research and add them all up, it's probably on that width, right? Maybe not, maybe a little less, but it's still a lot. Uh, so less brute force simulation, maybe orthogonal approaches, whatever. Um, but I think, uh, and I'm going to start with weird sensors and tell you a little bit about that, but I think that ultimately um, we need to be doing something different because if it is to do what Cruz and Waymo and others are doing at a smaller scale, that feels both uh, a duplication of effort, but also that we are ill-equipped to compete with them in brute force approaches like label 200 million car images. Okay, so what are the problems that I think are going to continue to bedevil us in the sort of uh, self-driving car space. Uh, things like smoke and fog, glare, motion blur, uh, darkness, those are all challenges when you think about perception, at least from optical cameras or optical related cameras that are gonna be left to, to address. So again, try to work on something that other people are not working on because you know, there's a lot of people working on camera-based perception these days, self-driving cars. Uh, so we built this rig uh, back at Michigan uh, still there with uh, Mal Vasa Davin um, for the Ford Center for Autonomous Vehicles. And uh, we put a lighter on there. Cool. Everybody has one of those. We put two additional sensors that are more interesting. So we had some RGB cameras, whatever. But we had these uncooled microbolometers, which are thermal cameras that are fairly inexpensive. When I say fairly, on the order of a couple thousand dollars. And then a very, very expensive uh, cooled thermal camera, which uses a weird metal that they probably mine unethically in some weird part of the world. Uh, and you have to cool down to super cool temperatures um, to um, be able to image with, but produces these very high resolution, high quality cameras. Great. Okay, so you know if we're thinking about adverse weather conditions or the things that would limit the scaling of self-driving cars, and I think adverse weather being a large one, right? Let's think about snow. There's a ton of snow in Michigan, um, so we went, took our cameras out there, and did a bunch of work in the snow. And so you can see the effect of uh, snow on LIDAR. There's a ton of noise that exists there, um, sort of in the, hanging there in the mid frame. Um, and you can see that uh, in the thermal camera images, you get a fair bit uh, more clarity, um, even in fairly heavy snow conditions. Um, and yeah. Okay. Uh, so when we're talking about thermal, what do we mean? Well, let's look at this little um, spectrum diagram. Uh, so you have your visible light there, your standard RGB camera, great. Uh, you have your uh, 900 nanometer uh, Velodyne there. And then you have up there radars in a much higher frequency. Those are all good. Um, cameras have high resolution, lighters have moderate resolution, radar typically has a low resolution. Um, but we're talking about something else here, right? So this is um, thermal cameras that go up higher there in the spectrum, and they can have sort of a moderate resolution, but they're sort of passive, which is, uh, tends to be a good thing for a variety of energy reasons, but also they tend to be more or less sensitive to obscurities. Um, so there's this kind of trade-off between the cheap ones, which are the ones that would really be deployable for self-driving cars or other applications in sort of the low-cost range, and then the things that people use in the uh, sort of more scientific, um, high-end, cool thermal cameras. Uh, so microbolometers, the ones there on the left, right? They're always exposed. They're sort of equivalent of a rolling shutter camera. If you think about it in that way, they don't require any cooling, uh, and they're sort of low in size and power. Uh, the other cameras, the cool thermal cameras, are a photoelectric effect. Um, uh, they have controllable exposure time. Each frame is individual. They're more like a global shutter camera. Uh, they require cooling to 77 Kelvin to bring you back to your chemistry days. If you remember Kelvin. Uh, and they are bulky and fragile. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, an idea we had is can we figure out some way of creating uh, images from the cooled thermal camera 
um, and matching them with images from the uncooled thermal camera and learn something about how to denoise or process the uncooled thermal cameras in a way that gives us sort of high resolution, um, better imagery. So uh, the really cheap ones, 3K, the slightly more expensive uncooled camera is 20K, uh, and that more expensive one is 200K, um, but also really bulky as much as we thought. Great. So they started with smoke and fog. Um, and so again, this is the thermal camera, visible camera below that, and then LIDAR. And what you're going to see is sort of a increase in fog. Hope this is video continues. Well, we'll just let it play. Um, but you're hopefully going to see, uh, there you go, increasing fog or smoke uh, there in the visible camera spectrum um, over there on the right. And you can see the thermal camera is far less affected, right? So you can't really see anything there um, in the visible camera, but the thermal camera is doing an okay job. And you do notice it in the LIDAR, right? You can see that really heavy fog um, showing up in the LIDAR. Okay, so we know this is a problem. What can we do about it, right? Well, so we know that the thermal cameras are better, but the challenge is, you know, why can't we just use those? Well, if you look at the thermal image at 200 hertz, you can see a great deal, A, of low resolution, but B, of blur, right? So if I pull a single image out from that, right, it, has a, it exhibits a ton of motion blur, actually very difficult to recognize objects from within the frame. So our goal here was to perform motion deblurring of thermal imagery. And the, the idea was, well, can we use the physics of the thermal camera itself to be able to facilitate this, right? So this is just an equation that shows the photoelectric image formation model, right? So pretty straightforward. You have an image that's created. Uh, the pixels of it are formed by uh, an integral that, that runs over the exposure time of how long you have the camera open to be exposed for photons to strike the source and um, make it electrically respond. So uh, a good visual representation of that is if I have a little dot spinning around, right? Um, uh, those are going to be, on a global shutter camera, those are going to be the, with a short enough exposure time, those are going to be pictures of the dot as we move. Uh, and as that exposure time goes up, right, we're going to see motion blur, which is just the uh, exposure of the same pixel to you know, multiple pieces of that dot spinning around. Okay, so what, how do microbolometers, a very different sensor, actually form their images? Well, it's very different. First off, it's passive. So that radiation is just coming off everything out there, black body radiation out there in the world. Um, but it's not incredibly different. It is essentially that there's a thermal time constant, right, that represents how long you know, I've been exposed to that radiation. And you're measuring that and trying to understand the decay of that over time. Okay, so... Uh, here we go. This is just a simple scene of a ball in a circular motion. Uh, and if we were to have the perfect version of it, it's the blue line, right? But what's actually going to happen is that the temperature of it at that X dot there is going to decay in that fashion um, uh, that looks like that. Okay. So what does that result in, in in reality, right? So there's motion blur in invisible cameras on the top frame, but motion blur with the microbolometer is more significant, much higher time constant. So that tau looks like that. And so we end up with a very, very blurry image. Um, the equivalent of if you had a really long exposure time with the camera. That's because the cells on the thing that your microbolometer that are receiving it heat up and then need to cool back down. Okay. So, you know, from the literature, right, there's a ton of frame wise motion deblurring, right? So we can just think about this as a frame wise problem, right? H is a model of relative motion. Both H and L are unknown, right? And so that's if we wanted to do a frame-wise deblurring, that's how you'd go about that. But we wanted to approach this pixel-wise because we know that the thermal um, time constant of each pixel in the microbolometer, you know, obeys this uh, fairly well-conditioned form. And so tau is fixed and it can be calibrated so we can figure out how long it takes for the thing on the microbolometer to cool down. And only in that case is L and Right? So we can form that as an inverse problem. Great. Um, and you know, if we think about fluctuations we're expecting to see over time and in temperature, we want to figure out a way of tracking that such that we know that we're going to get close to the original source. Okay, so we rearrange that, solve it as an argmin problem. What does that look like in practice? So here's our blurred input. 
You can just use a straight up GAN to deblur it with no knowledge of what is actually happening in the scene, right? And you end up with sort of uh, ghosting effects and blending people into the background, which is all bad. And then this is a non-machine learning based, so maybe don't get excited about it, I guess. A non-machine learning based way of doing this is it uses the physics that underlie what we know about uh, the microbolometer, and you can eliminate the blurring, um, and you can also prevent things from blending into the background, kind of preserve the crisp edges. Um, again, just using the physics of what we're doing here it ends up being much, much faster than being able to do it um, within GAN. It's very overkill. Uh, so, okay, well, does this matter in practice? Like, why do I actually care about this? Cool, you have deep blurred images. Well, we ran object detectors on that. And even over those GAN detector or GAN deblurs, um, we're able to do significantly better uh, identifying cars and people and whatever um, uh, in images um, that we deblur using this technique. So the ultimate goal here is, okay, if we know the physics of these sort of cheaper sensors and we use those to deblur them, that we can actually then recognize stuff from them better than we could otherwise. Okay, great. So the limitation of this, right, is it required 200 hertz data from a top of the line market. And so the challenge with this approach is, uh, you know, as exciting as it was for us to have a non-machine learning based way of solving this, was that we needed this really expensive sensor or somewhat expensive sensor to do this. And so that, that led us to another thing that we wanted to think about here, which is, okay, well, can we generate this sort of high frame rate ground truth data um, through some other means? And particularly for thermal cameras, right, uh, getting pixel-wise around ground truth is really, really hard. You can use a beam splitter that has a whole bunch of other associated problems it's difficult to set up uh, and can be expensive to implement. Uh, and so what we want to do is we want to end up with this ground truth to be able to calibrate that deep learning approach we just talked about without having to use any sensors. Okay. So how do we attain dense ground truth in adverse lighting and weather conditions? Uh, so NERFs, you know, we'll top on the bandwagon, something else everyone's excited about. Um, uh, but they are really good. So neural radiance fields, another example of how computer vision has come and um, made things harder for us in robotics by figuring out something 20 years ago that actually works really well now. Neural radiance fields, right, but they uh, volumetric scene representation, primarily good for rendering uh, new views of things. Um, CBD, what else it will be useful for in future, but people are very excited about it. There's 70 million papers on it. Um, uh, but it enables, right, this novel view synthesis uh, and dense, dense depth estimation. Um, and it works way better than what we were doing before, which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So it's limited to unbounded outdoor scenes, uh, limited for unbounded outdoor scenes with sparse input data and varying illumination. Um, so it works really well if you take your camera and you move it around or you move it like this and you can get the views. In between, but if I just like walk through this whole room, it doesn't work terribly well. Great. Okay. So, uh, you know, hopping on the Nerf bandwagon, uh, Cloner is uh, some work uh, coming out of um, uh, formerly my lab at Rom's lab but with um, one of our former graduate students who's graduated, but he's interested in saying, okay, can we use LIDAR to address this challenge of sparsity that exists with the Nerf problem because. I need a lot of views to be able to accurately reconstruct the depth and then consequently accurately reconstruct the image. Can I use LIDAR, some really accurate estimate of depth that's much sparser, and then address this challenge that we're really interested in? Can we render novel views that are pixel-wise very accurate and very complete without having to try to just actually reproject everything or fill holes or do whatever? Okay, so what are we gonna do? The training input is gonna be a single image and a single LIDAR scan, right? Uh, and then we want to render a novel view uh, using this to be able to render novel views without having to have taken many, many, many other images. Great. Okay. Uh, so the sort of underlying piece of this is what lots of people in robotics do all the time, occupancy grid mapping. So we create an occupancy grid, a 3D occupancy grid for prediction, right? We then pass a sensor array, sensor array through that. You use important sampling just as you would in a normal NERF to figure out where do I care about, where do I not care about in there, uh, and then apply um, uh, the NERF to get new samples, right? So we have a RGB MLP and a Sigma MLP, and we use both of those in two separate pieces as opposed to combine to then be able to render volumetrically a predicted color. And a predicted okay, 
So the sort of key insight here is because we know the LiDAR is actually really, really accurate from a depth perspective, much more so than what the image is gonna give us, we separate out the two MLPs. So the LiDAR rays are gonna be used for the Sigma MLP training and the camera rays are gonna be used for the RGB MLP training, right? And we have this occupancy grid mapping sampling in between and we use that and we get a bunch of predicted depths, right? And we use the separate camera rays to get a bunch of predicted colors. Great, so what does that look like in practice? Well, off very few um, samples, we can render a bunch of uh, synthetic views uh, and a bunch of synthetic depth. So that's panning around um, uh, a uh, reconstructed occupancy grid um, with, again, uh, a very sparse amount of data. Okay, so novel view synthesis, those are really small. Um, uh, but we can synthesize lots of novel views. We can synthesize lots of novel depths. Um, we're comparing it to a bunch of other things that people have tried in that same space. But the upshot is that uh, if you just look at the straight up ground truth LIDAR, it's very, very sparse. Uh, if you take this approach, you can get a much denser version of that. You can try other things um, like just out of the box and they tend to not work terribly well because they're too sparse to converge um, uh, on this little data. Great. So we can leverage nerds to learn deep Dense scene representation for challenging driving scenes. Good. Okay, so let's bring this back to the thermal camera problem, right? Okay, so we have image one and image three. And the reason I show you both of these is that you can see that there's an incredible amount of parallax because we're moving, we're looking sideways and we're moving pretty far distances, right? So you can see that there's a mailbox in one and it's gone in the second one because we've shifted significantly. So unlike in a traditional NERF problem where you'd want to have very continuous coverage, we have very sparse coverage with a thermal camera. Right, so uh, here's a baseline. We just try to use a nerf out of the box that works very poorly, as we would expect, because you don't have sufficient uh, data in between the two sources. Um, okay, so let's fuse in that thermal imagery and the LIDAR, use this cloner technique that I told you about, and then we can render new views that are pretty significant shifts um, uh, in space from the original one. Um, using just the sort of enhanced depth data we have. Why do we care about this? Well, if we're interested in using these sort of lower cost thermal cameras uh, and we want to figure out a ground truth data set for that, right? There's a mechanism we can use here, which is to get um, fairly accurate LiDAR depth data and then use that to render a bunch of novel views of the thermal camera to then make comparisons or learn denoising approaches like we talked about earlier, all those kinds. Um, so you end up with per pixel depth that actually looks really, really good, even though you have fairly sparse information from the LIDAR. And one of the sort of counterintuitive things here, or perhaps things that's not obvious, is that you end up really getting a uh, very refined depth estimate that's quite good, even though you have very sparse, fairly accurate depth information and sort of not a ton of visual information from the thermal camera. Uh, so that's depth from image two, depth from image three. We can also calculate per pixel optical flow. Um, would be important for some applications. So that's a camera only nerf in the center. Uh, that's a coupled MLP there, which again is uh, what you would do in a standard nerf. And then sort of this infrared nerf approach over there. And the first thing that should be noticeable, right, is the depth is much, much cleaner. Um, and then also ignoring the uh, sort of noise in the background at infinity, right, you can just look at the road and the trees to get a much cleaner thermal image. Okay, uh, here's a much denser, denser street scene. You can see a variety of cars there. You can see that camera only really doesn't work with this level of sparsity. So a uh, good lesson here is you would need to take many, many more images if you're gonna to try to do this with just the camera. Uh, and then the coupled is quite noisy, but you can again see the clarity of uh, the infrared approach. Uh, whatever, here's some more results. Parking structure, great, not great. Uh, really uh, we just want to show that you can you sort of improve this by using this occupancy grid mapping. So that's uh, 128 uniformly sampled, uh, uniformly spaced samples versus 64 uniformly spaced samples plus 64 samples from the occupancy grid mapping uh, by focusing occupancy grid just the same way you would um, for other robot approaches. You get a better nerf, better results. Uh, okay, so the other kind of nice non-obvious thing here is you get sort of an implicit denoising. If you look at the ground truth there of two, 
Um, you can see then a rendered image there over on the right, uh, and it suppresses lots of that sort of high frequency noise that's coming off that thermal camera um, that you expect. Okay. Implicit denoising of point clouds, right? That's a point cloud. There's some noise in there. There's also a lot of sparsity, uh, and that's the rendered um, uh, depth map you get um, from Infrared. Great. Okay. So finally, the, the sort of last piece of this, we want to render images uh, as if they were taken from the microbolometers pose because we're interested now in aligning those two pieces of data such that we can then um, make assessments on um, denoising the microbolometer. So that's the cooled camera rendered by the infrared in the exact same position as the microbolometer. And now we have a pixel-wise aligned um, set of infrared data to be able to make decisions on what we uh, and we also have again, step data and optical flow. So the hope is that you can then use approaches like this, and this sort of goes back to this idea, okay, well, what can we do with simulation? Maybe we can't do a ton with simulation, right, uh, in the visible spectrum or, or, you know, photorealistic, but what if we were to start to think about using approaches like NERF and synthetic rendering to render different lenses, different positions, different resolutions, different frame rates, or you know different positions that we were not actually in to begin to think about simulation in that domain where we're taking real data and trying to render novel views as opposed to uh, what lots of simulation uh, at least in the sort of visual spectrum is focused on on increasingly photorealistic renderers right because I think the challenge with that is that video games are spending billions of dollars trying to make the best photorealistic renderers we can make and we're sort of you know uh, I think we're not going to be able to compete with that in academia. We're not going to make a better renderer than Epic Games and 50 artists. But then the question is, well, if we want to think about simulating things in the visible you know, light space or LIDAR or whatever, perception sensors, um, maybe NERFs offer us some insight into where we could go. Great. Party thoughts. So I think we're in a weird moment for robotics, right? So we were talking about self-driving and we're talking about sort of this huge influx of uh, money and attention and other things. And so my question really is, okay, we're not seeing the sort of scaled robotic solutions that sort of we were promised, but we are seeing this huge influx of money. And so I'm quite worried or quite concerned that um, perhaps we've over-indexed into a few very narrow areas. We've invested very heavily in those. And if those don't work out, people are going to say, well, robotics is too far off, right? It doesn't work. It's not commercially viable. Right. And so the question I have, and hopefully we can get into it in the discussion, is like, well, where do we think the field should be going? What should we be chasing? Right. How close are we in some domains? But more importantly, like, how do we scale robotic technology to, you know, actually solve real problems in people's lives? So I think that's important. Um, uh, the speed of change, I think, is another interesting question. And we were talking about this earlier. But if you look at, you know, things like where generative models are for, image generation as a as an example, right? This is where they were in 2015, making their little uh, 32 by 32 squares. I think that's supposed to be a horse over there on the bottom. They can do black and white faces kind of okay. That's a dog, that one's pretty good, right? Versus in 2022, where you say, I want a photo of an astronaut riding a horse and you get that. Or say, I want an Italian town made of pasta, tomato, and basil and you get that, um, right? Uh, still have Homer Simpson in Psycho 1960, you get that, which is good, right? So how do we get fast? How do we get better faster, right? Uh, these folks are out there racing ahead, making their Hummer Simpson psychos, uh, but they have really made it pretty far in the last six years. If that's the problem you're into solving, you've gone pretty far in six years. Um, we were sort of lamenting that actuators have gotten, I don't know, two, five times better in my lifetime, right? Uh, whereas GPU power has gotten tens of thousands of times faster, right? And so the question left for robotics is that, you know, uh, we see all these advances in other sort of related disciplines. It's not really what we're doing, right? Like, we're not trying to do this. And the second important thing to focus on when we think about Homer Simpson Psycho is that, like, eh, anything that kind of was 90% of the way there, your brain's going to make up the rest of it and be like, that looks pretty good. Uh, if I were to ask for that same generative network for a very accurate depth map of this room, and it gave me one that was, like, 90% of the way there, you would recognize that it was more and that it probably needed a bunch of improvement to get somewhere. So when we, when we think about sort of the advances in both uh, natural language, things like large language models and image generation models, the humans are doing a lot of the heavy lifting that comes to saying what is right um, and what is wrong. And I think there's a lot of ways 
likely to go what we want to do. How do we get better faster? And, and when we get to the discussion, um, I kind of want to pull the room. But I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that, like, uh, I was at a conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, something. And I asked everybody, can you think of an example of a deployed machine learning system that's not for object identification or for whatever, but it's for a robot system that is like moving around and needs to control itself in some and we, and this is a group of mostly entrepreneurs, not academics. And I said, a scaled one, one where you go to the store and you buy it and you bring it home and your neighbor has it or everybody in your factory has it. And it's not a PID loop. It is a machine learning approach to figuring out how to move through the world. And nobody can come up with an example. One guy came up with one. He thinks, and I'd love to see if anybody has a better example. He thinks in the latest iRobot vacuum cleaner, they use a uh, learning-based approach to figure out how to control the actuators to get onto the carpet and off the carpet. That's his belief. I don't know if that's actually true. We'll have to do some fact checking with iRobot. But he believes that it, that it is true that those robots being sold out into the world are probably a good example of a deployed, scaled machine learning approach to robotics that's not image detection. But anyways, we'll see. Okay. Uh, so the questions that I think that we're left with are what scale, right? What are the technologies we're building that are going to scale? And not like we have to scale them, but what are the things that are ready to scale, right? So that was my survey question about, well, let me, let me pause there and ask, can anyone out, does anyone have a different deployed machine learning system that's not perception that they know about that exists? No one? I was really sad. We, we, we noodled on it. Someone, no one has any. Yeah, yeah, no, so for, 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 for language systems, for the, all over the place, for sure, no question, uh, that works. But no, but this has to like move around in the world with wheels or legs or, yes. Okay, so, so on Animal, the, uh, for everyone else's edification, the quadruped, we think it's an RL system uh, to control it moving across unnamed terrain. I would argue that's not scaled yet in that, like, I think you have an animal. I think Ram, my old colleague, has one. I think there's a few floating around in Switzerland. But, but yes, so the question is, like, will that scale? I think that's the question, right? So, like, I have seen a ton of videos. I got a few smart people at CMU working on that, running uh, other quadrupeds over uneven terrain. And the question I'm left with, do we believe that that is going to be, can I, could I scale that today, right? Could I just make 150,000 of those and postal workers with animals with things on the back? If the perception problem is solved, let's leave that aside. And I don't know, right? That's the question. Our quadrupeds seem to fall over basically every time we take them out. And you get like 30 good seconds of them running on like dirt and then they fly. Uh, over and then they break and they're full of dirt and it's really, really bad. But yes, like I do think of that. But so this is the question. I think we're, we're seeing systems that are there, but mostly in research labs or mostly in, but that's a good example. Another one? Yes. Well, well Tesla's a good example. So uh, yes, that is scaled. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if that's a good thing that it is scaled, right? So like there are some RL systems deployed on that, right? But they keep seeming to slam into things and, and that seems bad. But yes, now Spot's an interesting one. Do, you, do they use RL for their control of their actuators? I don't know. Also, I'd argue, sadly, Spot is not scaled. There's like, you know, whatever, uh, 500 of them, but like they don't, they have yet to do a thing that's like super useful um, in my humble opinion. But yeah, I think we're getting there. But I think so, but, but okay, so, but let me ask the question uh, then a second way, right? It sounds like even the examples we're giving in the best case scenario, we're really early on, right? So like the test of things is still in beta. <laughs> Spot is like, you're not gonna walk outside and see one. So we're, we're getting there, but it's still really early on. The question is, are we pushing the gas on the right? I would argue the Tesla one is probably not the right one to push the gas on, metaphor intended, uh, because it's very dangerous, right? I don't know if it's ready to scale. Right? That's a good question. Anything else? Yes. 
That's a good question. Yeah. There are very few mobile robots in the world. And, and maybe the answer is that we're going to start with sort of less mobile robots, like a washing machine, which is like, I wouldn't call it a mobile robot, but it's a robot and has some motion in it and whatever. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that, that maybe that's an interesting one. Does anyone have any of those examples? Semi-mobile robots, robots with a moving part. But the, the point, right? I have a washing machine. I think it has a smart mode where it figures out how long to wash. Okay, well, we'll keep noodling on it. Uh, that was the end of my thing, so I will stop there, and then we can maybe dig in on that. All right, looks like the uh, speak one more time. We've got our our uh, uh, panelists. That is a uh, seal on the bottom side of my robot, uh, looking up at it, asking a question. <laughs> Matt, uh, thank you so much for this very, very inspiring talk. Uh, we remind the people on Zoom that uh, we have the Q&A button if they want to submit their, their questions. Uh, and I think that there are a couple of questions that you raised during your talk that, that could be good triggers for questions. The first one is like, um, why do you think that there is like this gap between media and reality when you talk about like autonomous driving and mobile robots? Uh, what do you think that universities can do to differentiate with with business that have a lot of resources to, to move this technology forward? And uh, what do you think the universities should, should focus on? Um, and I would like to start with uh, one question uh, that is, uh, what do you think that is the role of open source in, in all this, this revolution? Because we saw a great example with, for instance, the Linux kernel is running everywhere. Uh, and we don't see any similar example in the um, uh, autonomous driving uh, world. So do you think that this is something that could be the key for, for uh, scaling uh, autonomous driving? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'd love to get other people's thoughts too, and I want to dominate the conversation. But uh, I, I would say that um, two things have been important in the academic side of autonomous driving. Kitty, which is, you know, yeah. open source-esque. Uh, I don't know exactly what the license is, but, you know, everyone can get it. Um, and then certainly GitHub's around for object detection or tracking or X or Y or Z. Um, I would say are the primary um, way in which the academic side of the house has focused on AVs, right? So, um, and I think two interesting things have happened, computer vision, which has been quite successful and machine learning, which has also been quite successful, have come into that space. And so the number of, and the speed of evolution in uh, NeuroIPS or uh, ICML or CVPR, people working on what we would have called traditionally robotics problems, publishing every three months with a open source uh, uh, version of the code underlying it has pushed robotics in the right direction, right? We were jacking around with, I don't know, 50% closed source, no code attached papers for a long period of time, maybe even as recently as five years ago. And those communities have pushed us and, and now it is uh, much less common to release uh, robotics paper without any code attached, at least in the perception side of the house, I would say. Thank you. Do we have any questions in the audience? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so my question has is basically uh, two questions for uh, the NERF pipeline that you presented. Mm -hmm. um, the first is how does that pipeline respond to noise, uh, such as the imagery that you showed us of heavy snow, mm -hmm. uh, because I guess that kind of would put noise in the model and maybe, I don't know how the nerve reconstruction would behave in that case. Yeah. And the second is, what do you think would be the, what's a good target to set for the computational requirements of such a pipeline in order mm -hmm. to be deployed and to also be like financially reasonable after sure. it's deployed? Yeah, sure. So the first one is easy. Um, uh, and, you know, performance is going to degrade the more noise you introduce, but because it's sort of occupancy grid base, right? The uh, better your sensor model is. So for a lidar, you can have a semi-reasonable one. Then you can build some more complex ones if you. And we have a, actually a whole separate paper on snow that I didn't even talk about, which is attempting to do exactly this, which is just remove snow from lidar data. 
Um, so if you're interested, the student is uh, Mingyuan uh, Yu, he just graduated, but I'll point you to his paper. But um, the nice thing is those occupancy grids, as we know, work really well for reducing noise generally. And then nerfs on top of that also do a pretty good job of reducing noise and, and being really focused on only things on the surface and much less in the volume in between where your sensor is and the surface. Um, so, so they do actually pretty well. And, and you can have a fair bit of noise in both the LIDAR um, or even in the um, sort of alignment of, of your poses, and it still does an okay job. Now, your second part of your question is like computational expense. Um, you know, I used to be really worried about um, uh, making sure all the things we were developing were like, you know, real time so that it could run on a robot. I, I will tell you, I am less worried now, only that if we're doing everything on a GPU, we still have not hit sort of Moore's Law's limits for GPUs because they just sort of add more whatever. I, the cards keep getting bigger as far as I can tell. That's like, that's how they solve this problem. They seem to add more silicon. Um, but a thing that was not real time on the last generation of NVIDIA GPUs or pick your favorite GPU manager, you know, maker it is, is I, I found is like, you know, as long as it's not like, you know, two orders of magnitude out is, is real time in the next gen. So I think as long as you're sort of in the ballpark, now for nurse, they were notoriously slow, days to train, uh, you know, minutes to reconstruct an image, even that's gone away. So if you look at what, uh, there's a bunch of indexing techniques and tricks. So NVIDIA has a paper, which is like mm, pseudo real time. And they just, they play games to essentially make the recovery of the rays uh, and ray casting. But all of those are like uh, embarrassingly parallel problems. And so they, 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 if you do the right thing and create data structures, they can all be pretty real time. Uh, in my two cents. So there's, there's now, and, and, and the speed of evolutions on NERF is very quick. There's now like 10 or 15 real-time NERF papers that are, that are out there. And then the training is now sort of order minutes and then reconstruction order um, real-time frame rate. So, and, and, you know, graphics houses, other people are really excited about this now. So I think it will continue to accelerate and uh, you will have access to real-time NERFs in the next six to 12 months into prediction that I have. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the talk, man. Um, you, you brought up this sort of hype cycle, right? In, in the media. Um, and, and I'm gonna throw out one hypothesis for you to, to either agree with or disagree with. And I wanna get your thoughts on sort of what we should do as academics, but um, particularly given that you mentioned both Tesla and FTX today, mm. right? It, it seems like there's, there's sort of dual problems here of a fourth estate that with pretty limited exceptions is not really able to assess the technology. Yep. I mean, there's people like Kara Swisher out there who can, right? right. But not a lot. Sure. Um, and then you have these sort of social media driven hype trains. Um, you know, uh, you know, I know you use Twitter, right? That's, that's one great example. Yeah. And particularly when in, in the AI space as well, right? It's a lot. Yeah. So you know, what's our role as, as academics, um, you know, in, in including people with, with louder megaphones like yourself, and, and how you know how should we be working to to ensure that actual information is being being disseminated? Well, I would say stay off Twitter if you want to keep your job. That's my first advice. There's never a news. Here's a news story you'll never read: professor loses job for not having Twitter account. But the opposite story, you do read. No, but in seriousness, I do think it's a really important issue, right? So the question I think at core is twofold. One, I think journalists are not equipped to cover. Um, particularly uh, science journalists, science journalism is a hard field in general. It is hard for a journalist to cover the breadth of scientific work that's happening. And they do an amazing job of trying to do that, but it's a hard job in and of itself. I think the problem comes when science journalists have a hard job and they're covering, they used to cover mostly scientists. And if you cover a scientist, a scientist is going to be very measured in what they say. And academics can be very measured in what they say. They're going to be like, well, you know, there's some reasons why this is good and some reasons why it's bad. And they'll call some other of your academic buddies up and they'll be like, I wasn't on the paper, but here's what I think. And you get a fairly balanced coverage. So if you're inter interested in gecko skin moistness, I'm sure the science article you read on that in the, in the popular press is probably going to be pretty even handed and pretty good. I think where the problem comes in is that we have, there's an incredible financial incentive to say your thing is really, really good. If you're running a startup or trying to get money for a startup or have an established bit, whatever, right? 
And FTX is a great example. If you have somebody who has a benefit in saying this thing is worth a lot of money and is really great and amazing and X and Y and Z, that is an incredibly dangerous combination because it's very hard to interrogate that, not only because that person has an incentive, but if the whole industry has an incentive to say that things are great, right? It's a reinforcing, right? Nobody's getting their company funded because of the one on Twitter saying none of this works, right? Like that's not helping people raise money. And I think that is the challenge. So I think our job as academics and as students and as people studying this, I think is to be very skeptical and to be inherently skeptical on extraordinary claims without evidence, right? And um, I'm increasingly reticent to listen to people that have excuses as to why they cannot show you or demonstrate how their thing is better or good or whatever. And this idea, it's like, oh, well, we don't want to give away the proprietary nature of it. We don't want to do X. We don't want to do Y. We don't want to do Z. We have so many examples of that being cover for a thing being magic beans as opposed to actually being proprietary that now I'm quite skeptical when someone tells me, I can't tell you how it works because it's secret. That to me makes me very uncomfortable. Um, and the, the only winning thing we have is that uh, there are no financial stakes in academia, <laughs> vanishingly small. I mean, that's, that's sort of true, right? But then you have you know, Facebook and, and OpenAI yeah. and, who are very close to academia, right? Well, I would agree. And I think if this, is the, this gets at where my greatest fear is, is that those companies have a, a vested financial interest in saying things work amazingly for their stock price to go up. And increasingly, and this sort of gets at one of the big challenges, uh, lots of people that you used to be able to put in the box of no financial incentive to say things are good now exist in three boxes. <laughs> one box being, uh, I'm going to say this is good so that the stock price goes up. And this isn't to say that every academic who's off working in industry is lying to us every day. They are not. Uh, most of them remain very, very good people. But the ones that got infinitely rich, you got to have some questions about what they're up to. I don't know. You know? Anyways, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but I, love, I, I think this is an important issue for all of you. So if anybody else has thoughts, please, please give them to us. Do we have uh, more questions from the audience? Don't be shy. One on, you said one online? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, so as roboticists, we often think about how cool our research is, right? So we build like a, like a lot of cool stuff and post cool videos. But in reality, you know, like technologies are what solves real world problems. So there is a, I would say, uh, like, like gap, you know, like between what we build and what we want to solve. Mm -hmm. So to address this gap, what do you think we should do? Sh should we go into the real world and ask the firefighters so we can solve our search and rescue like problems better? Or do you think we should just, you know, like do the cool stuff as we have always done? Uh, no, I think that's a really good question. We were actually talking about this earlier. I do think that problems from industry Things that are going to make money in some ways are good because they are grounded to things that people would be willing to pay for or need solved for money. So that is a that's a useful forcing function to make you work on things that are like useful as opposed to not useful. Um, I think at its extreme, it's challenging in the sense that like if we only to work on problems that we think are that businesses have, the question is, you know, what is the time horizon that businesses are thinking over? And I think it's important for us to maintain. Uh, research threads or things that we think are important over longer time horizons because the, the nature of sort of quarterly reporting and the way that businesses work uh, precludes them oftentimes for thinking 20 years in the future, right? And so many of you will build careers where hopefully you'll have a problem that you want to solve that will take you the entirety of your career. And like that is a useful thing and space to be able to have. And you'll be able to spend the next 20 years trying to solve X and that's great. Uh, and if you can ground X to a thing that other people think is useful or cool or important, I think that's also really good. And I think the reason that this is an important question is 20 years ago, we were working on cool things because there did not seem to be a path to it solving massive economic problems, or at least a short-term path for massive economic problems, right? And I think we've moved out of the zone where if it was 20 years in the future, it was good to solve in academia, and companies would worry about it once it got there. 
And it, now it's in striking distance. And so I think it has changed the, the calculus to some degree where now companies are interested in investing because maybe it's five years out or maybe it's three years out, maybe it's two years out. And that's good. That means that you're working on something that matters and then it's important and that people think it's going to work. Uh, but I think both are important, right? So uh, in your portfolio of research, in the same way you would think about investing, diversify, have some problems that you think are really long-term that are going to be take a long time to solve and involve many pieces and maybe your whole career. And then definitely have some short-term wins. <laughs> Otherwise, you're never going to write any papers and you're never going to you know, uh, move on with your uh, thesis and graduate and go do whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, so I, I, and maybe another meta comment there is that I think that, that we introduced a culture in robotics of demonstrating videos that showed cool things happening, which was good in some ways, but also really shifted the, uh, the focus of a lot of robotics research so that you spent time on a thing that worked once in a really cool video. And, you know, uh, I worry that we, there's no prize for a 15 hour video of folding laundry over and over and over again and never messing up, right? There isn't a version of that, right? But that is what a robot that would do this uh, commercially successfully would have to do. And so I don't know how we bridge that gap, right? Now, you should not spend your time writing, a, making a 15 hour time lapse video of a robot folding clothes over and over and over again. I would not recommend that, but, but there's something to that, right? That there's a, and that's what we're seeing in driving, right? So uh, getting 97% on kitty car detection is great. Uh, clearly it doesn't turn into a cruise car never getting stuck, right? And so there's some gap. Uh, we have one more question. So I guess building off actually what you just said, the you know the car detection not not immediately translating into into results. I think you've what you've presented today um, in terms of like your own advancements and kind of what we thought about is still sort of squarely in the perception space. And so you're sort of attributing that lack of you know um, you know why did those cars get stuck to to the perception problem. And I'm curious your, about your thoughts on we've sort of talked about learning and and control as a you know a thing that's not really out there yet um but i guess as someone who works in for example the human robot interaction space i see the sort of controls and that that side of things as being a uh, arguably even the larger reason that i think a lot of these things oh, yeah. don't work and so i'm curious about your thoughts on sort of what we should be working on in that space i guess perception is probably more your field but um i guess that that seems like a key piece as well yeah. No, that's a that's a great uh, great question. So I, I will start and say that the 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 first meta comment is that like, and we're all or some of us. I'm very guilty of this, but I think we're all guilty of this in some way. We all bring the lens of the of the stupid thing we've been working on since we were in undergrad. Like I've known as perception for the last twenty years, right? <laughs> so so now I'm in a position where we're supposed to look at other types of research, but I bring that perception lens because like I am still that grad student working on that stupid object detection problem that doesn't work from twenty years ago, right? Uh, but I would fully agree in, in both in two ways. One, I think that perception has advanced significantly in such a way that it is not clear to me that it is um, uh, its gradient seems to be in some direction that I'm more confident in than the gradient we're seeing in solving both planning and control problems. But I put those in all in one group. How do I decide how to move through the world? Right. Um, and I would uh, chalk that up to two things. One is it is much harder to write a control or planning related paper because you need to have things actually move and you can't do closed world experimentation on a control problem because it's like, I can't just have a data set and decide what I would have done and then not do it, right? And so that I think creates just a structural problem for that field. Um, and then I think the second issue is that there, and this is sort of more of a meta concern, but there's sort of now, uh, the field is fractured in some way where we have some people that work on, uh, some people from machine learning have come over and are interested in solving control problems and planning problems as learning problems. And, and that sort of is progressing in sort of a direction. And then there's people that are coming from more of a classical controls, hybrid control, whatever, nonlinear control background that are also continuing to make progress and, and whatever. Uh, but to some degree, these fields have diverged a little bit is my feeling, right? Um, now, there's many people trying to bridge the gap, and it's not to say that they're whatever, but um, if you go to ask somebody from classical controls, like what's solved and what isn't, 
you get a very different answer than you go ask somebody that does just RL based control problems. You get different answers to what problems are solved. Or not. I think the thing we can agree on is robots still don't work, right? So neither of them have really figured it out. Um, and so to that end, I would say like, uh, I sort of lost the second half of your question in my ramblings. What was the second half of your question? Oh, I think, I guess from my own, my own lens and, and perspective, as you were talking about, I, I think the, the piece of it that's interacting in a world with other agents, yep. namely human agents and things like that. Um, and, you know, I think there's the, the ML and the controls that you just talked about sort of in isolation, um, are hard enough in and of themselves, but I think also, you know, I don't remember specifically what I asked about it, but I guess how you think about problems with, you know, agent interaction yep. and, and things like that. Yeah. So, so I guess getting to that, I think that the, the other problem we're seeing is that this again is a meta problem that robotics has grown to a size where HRI is over here doing its HRI thing and that's its own community. And, you know, people go to CDC and ACC and they do their thing. And then I go do my thing at whatever perception-based conferences, right? But we have this fracturing. And, and I think one of the challenges is that um, I would agree, I don't think we're going to see scale deployed robotic systems without solving all of those problems to a level that uh, is, is on par with human performance, right? So if agents act really weird and, and they're very hard to predict and whatever, and they're uncomfortable to interact with, you're not gonna scale that because no one's gonna want those robots in their world or their space or near them, or they're dangerous because they don't know how humans are gonna behave and they do things that are unsafe. And, and um, yeah, so I, I guess um, on the AV front, I think there are so many open and unsolved problems when it comes to planning and interacting with human agents and all of those things that even if we had solved the perception problem, even if we had solved the classic control problem of I need to go from here to here under these uncertainties, make the robot execute that, even if both of those were solved, I still think we would be in trouble because other agents would, would undermine the ability to behave safely. And I guess the this is a little depressing, but the 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 <laughs> The fundamental gap, I would say, that is always going to exist in AVs is that you have to drive under some assumptions that other people are going to do certain things. You can't drive under uh, just a physics-based knowledge of what is possible, right? So like there's a pedestrian on the curb. I'm assuming they're not going to step off the curb while they could step off in under the distance I have to stop, right? But you can't drive in a world where you assume that every possible risk is equal and every possible risk is always going to happen. Now, quantifying those would even be a huge step beyond where we are right now because we don't even know there's a pedestrian on the curb. We don't know how likely they are to step off X, Y, and Z. But you have to drive under some of those assumptions. And so the intersection of where that meets, how much can I know about other agents and predict other agents, and what we can do on the control front in terms of how could I actually move around them or stop or whatever, the intersection of those is going to have to exist in some place that is closer to humans than it is a perfect you know, uh, industrial robot that never makes a mistake because, you know, humans are inherently, um, other agents, not even just humans, other agents are going to be inherently unknowable in some way, right? Unobservable. Sorry. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, I really like the the talk and and um, that you are the one question that's really interesting is uh, you know impact um, scaled robotics and learning and all that kind of stuff. So here here's a question I, and and uh, it may be a difficult question. So feel free to to back it up. <laughs> I, want, I want you I want you to like predict the future. Sure. So um, what is the thing that you think you asked the question? You know, are there any? Uh, uh, in your survey, are there any scaled robots that are using learning? So, what do you, if if we if there isn't any yet, mm -hmm. what do you think it will be? And a second part of that is, do you think uh, the self-driving cars will be at a state would be the first, or you think something else will happen with what? Yes. Okay. Great question, and I want to survey the audience on their opinion on self-driving cars too. Uh, okay, let me start with the first one. I don't think self-driving cars will be the first scaled robot technology that like really scales. Uh, for a couple of fairly non-technical reasons. Um, uh, it's expensive right now to scale self-driving cars, like, like fairly expensive. And um, the customer experience of them is currently 
worse than for a human driven car. And as a consequence of that, I, it would be hard for me to be, imagine economic incentives for really scaling that um, because you're, if presented with the two options right now, one is going to be a novelty, but it's going to take longer. It's going to not pick you up where you asked. It's going to not drop you off where you asked. And it could get stuck on the way, which is highly, those are highly rare events for human driven cars. Uh, a good example of that is I talked to the guy who um, was in charge of like the customer experience at Lyft. And he told me the thing that really blew my mind, the highest percentage reason for a low rated ride was being dropped off in a location you didn't want or being picked up far from where you asked to be picked up or taking a route you didn't want to take. Those are like the top three reasons. And it makes sense. Like if you get in a car and you say, hey, drop me off over there and it doesn't drop you off over there, it's really annoying. And you actually, like that's the most annoying thing if you're asking for a ride between two places, if it's raining or whatever. And that is like, that is the last thing to fall in self-driving. Even if we solved everything else, it's really hard. The curb, the last 50 feet to the curb is really hard. And like, you have to do an illegal thing usually. And you have to make a judgment call as to whether or not like you're going to get a ticket or like this is safe or whatever. And I think that's really, really hard. And then the second reason I don't think it's scalable uh, in its current form is um, just that like the amount of oversight that's required requires such a scaling up of human labor that like the expense of it and everything else is like whatever, uh, I think too high. Uh, and then the third reason is just that like, if you were to scale it today, it would still take a long time to build all the LIDARs and everything else and to calibrate the vehicles and whatever. You couldn't get 100,000, 300,000 cars on the road quickly. So um, uh, what do I think the first thing is going to be, which is a great question of scale? I think we're just going to continue to see scaling in the places where there are already robots. So like, I think factory automation. So like you go to Amazon warehouse, there's a ton of robots there. They're doing stuff already. They don't do everything, but they're doing more every day. I think that's an example where you can continue to see more. Uh, robots in your home, there's already Roombas there. So there's going to be more Roomba-like things. I have a Roomba vac. I have a Roomba um, mop. Uh, those are the only two things I have, but I can imagine more Roomba like things. Uh, I have a pool cleaner, I don't have a pool, but I have a pool cleaner because it seems like a cool robot. Uh, so more of that. Um, uh, I think you're going to see more drones in uh, areas where uh, falling out of the sky won't kill anyone. So not cities, but other places. Um, for actual things, for industrial expect, in, inspection, X and Y and Z. Uh, more uh, industrial inspection robots of different types, so bridges and tunnels and whatever robots that do that. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, while I, on this self-driving car thing, I don't know if everybody else has the same opinion that I do, that this is a really hard problem and we're not going to solve it. Do people feel like Kind of just like by show of hands, if you'll feel like there are working self-driving cars today, like do people believe that narrative, like that they work in any, in the, in the, in like, I can get in one and there's a greater than 80% chance I will end up in my destination. No one believes in that. Okay. Wow. Okay. Cause five years ago, people were really in a different space. Okay. So do we think we are a year away from an 80% chance of getting between two locations in a cruise vehicle in San Francisco at night? No, no, not single, two, only two people. Okay. Five years out from that? Okay, five years out. Okay, okay. So it's not like never going to happen, five years out. Okay, that's very helpful to me. Okay, so let me ask, yeah, who thinks, do you think long haul trucks is, is coming or is here? Okay, so coming. So like a year away from long haul trucks being on 2% of highways. Oh, I, I agree. I, I don't disagree. Uh, two, a year away? Two years away? Five years away? 10 years away? Okay, so, so, so longer than for cities, based on that hand show. They have to deal with weather, that's true. Okay, well, this is heartening to me that people think there's a lot of problems there. All right, that's fantastic. Let's Thanks, give our speaker a hand here. Uh, that's a, a really interesting talk. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us.
Uh, please tune in next Friday, December 9th at 1030 for our next grasp on robotics. We will have David Fuhi from the University of Michigan. Uh, for more information on upcoming events, be sure to check out our social media and our website. Thanks again and have a great day.